Uh, it seems to me, uh, coming from a, a trained solicitor, is a view that uh, I completely understand what Martin was saying about the need to, to follow the system of laws. But when the issue is that the laws are actually, as I think both Claire and Paul and Martin like very clearly showed, um, very market driven pro development, then I think that that something needs to change. And what Claire was talking about, about participatory democracy. Um, and surely at the moment we've got like all these concerns about climate change and the need to develop in a different way and to look at our land use, we need a different onus. Um, we need a different way in which plan decisions are actually made. So on that note, I'm gonna pass over to Jeff, who's going to do, run the Q and A session. Over to you, Jeff. Thanks, Alison. Uh, as always, uh, because I am the number one question and answer person for Aberdeen Climate Action, I start with an apology. I'm a guy, a bloke. I can only do one thing at a time. Um, I have three separate screens open on my computer. Trust me. I need them to keep on top of all of this uh, traffic that's going on. Um, my rule is first question in, first question out. I will depart from that rule uh, in order to allow most people, if not everybody, to have at least one question. Um, and so I'm gonna offer it to Susie Smith. Um, you have put in a long list of questions. Which one would you like to start with? And to who do you want to ask the question? Susie, over to you. Oh, yes, I can. Sorry, I thought I couldn't um, unmute myself. Okay, I'm just going to maybe ask my main... Can you hear me now? Yes, my yes. main question was about the Aberdeen local development plan. There's a bit that concerns our community for a lot of land all around the Bay of Nig that wasn't made until the response to the main issue report stage, when there was no opportunity for anybody, you know, the statutory consultees included, to respond to that until it did actually become incorporated into the local development plan. And a related issue to that is that bid was classified as undesirable by the council and slated by the environmental report. So how could it be that a bid like that could end up as an opportunity site in the local development plan? Okay, Susie, thank you. Um, who wants to go first? Paul, Martin? Well, uh, uh, can you hear me? Absolutely, right. yes. It's Aberdeen and I am Aberdeenshire. And I have to say, I do not know the detail of where they've got to, and I don't know exactly what happened. I'm just wondering if Aberdeen City is in the same stage as Aberdeenshire, you now have a proposed yes. local development plan, perhaps. This is what Aberdeenshire has. And therefore there would be, it may have passed, I don't know because I don't know about the city, but once the council has produced a proposed local development plan, there is a further round of public consultation. It was on Paul Davidson's diagram. Yes, we have, we've had that. And we've had that already, but it's the only chance you have right. to comment. But, but Indeed, it wondering. is. It seems very un undemocratic to put a bid in as a comment on, on the main issues report when there is no opportunity for the community to, to comment on it at that stage. Well, it. It's not the usual way of doing it, but as I say, I don't know the circumstances because it's it's not the council I'm a member of, so just, I don't know what it happened. It just happened. But, it was on the last day, but you know, that's... But the other thing is, it, how can a... What's the process by which a, a development bid that's been classified as undesirable can end up actually as an opportunity site in the local development plan? Well, I don't, I don't know. I, I mean, I just have to say, I just don't know what happened in Aberdeen City mm -hmm. Council because I'm not a member of Aberdeen yeah. City Council. It is certainly unconventional, but there is always an opportunity to comment because once the council has signed off what it thinks the development plan should be, i.e. the proposed local development plan, that then does go out to further consultation. And in that case, it is then up to Scottish government appointed reporters to decide whether yes, the council... Yeah 
is Without, right or not and recommend changes. That, there's about um, 200 responses to that and there's another one as well. So yes, we, it's now just about to go off to the reporters. So we're just waiting. Yes, so that, that would be the point at which somebody other than the council yes. gets yes. a say as yes. to whether it it's appropriate. But exactly what happened in this case, I have to say, I don't know, it not my council. It doesn't seem very democratic. Susie, anyway, it's certainly I'm not sorry neutral. I ask, Susie, is this the energy transition it, zone it is, that yes. you're talking about? It is. Mm -hmm. um, because this is going to be, this is, uh, I don't know if you've seen in the national planning framework, they have these things called national developments. So I don't know if you yes, have heard of because the harbour itself is a national development. But the part the That's right. Yeah, extension, all the harbour related activities in St. Fittix Park in June is all around Bay of Nigga, not national development, but the Harbour Board's submission to the NP4 call for ideas is pushing it to be a national development. But not yeah. only that, it wants to eliminate all green space, green belt protection, which it sees as restrictive development, even yeah. though it's impossible to mitigate. Yes. And it just seems to be completely out of sync with what yeah. everybody else is submitting. So, um, you know, Susie, I think I think there's been some quite some uh, negotiations going on behind the well, scenes, that's, um, that's which true. which uh, you can see if you look at the the proposals that have come forward on the national developments yeah, around there. Yeah. So um, that might have been that might be why it's it's come in. Um, so um, I'm aware of this a little bit. We've had a couple of inquiries about it uh, coming to our inquiry mm -hmm. service, um, and. So uh, if you want to, uh, you can get in touch a bit more. Um, as you know that there's this uh, Environmental Rights yeah, Centre Scotland and they're um, about that as hopefully, well, yeah. hopefully getting a new solicitor mm -hmm. soon. So it might be able to, because there might be something yeah, behind your one. in touch with uh, them and they pass it on. But thanks yes. very much anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for that, Claire. Uh, we'll move to uh, Alison, who has a question, I think for everybody. Yes, I do. I'm just going to find the exact phrasing of my question. <laughs> Basically, I was just wondering, um, is, has there been a point in time where the community have been successful? And, and what, has, what has made that success? And what, what, what's been the thing that's carried that? Like... Well, it's, uh, if I may uh, uh, answer that a little bit. Um, it's never one, it never seems to be the, the same thing. Communities are successful. Um, sometimes it's because they've run a, a very good campaign and they've got uh, local councillors on board. Um, and sometimes it's because, uh, you know, the, it's, it's gone up to the reporter and the reporters made the right decision. Um, what is often notable is, you know, an organised campaign and make a difference um, uh, and, and being a little bit ballsy, uh, being a little bit, um, you know, sometimes um, we have a recent example of a, an appeal where one of the ladies, um, actually she'd just been to the Planning Democracy Conference and, and, and spoken to one of the reporters in, in, in one of the uh, workshops that we had. So she, she felt emboldened uh, in dealing with her own appeal on a vast uh, housing development in South Ayrshire. Um, and she sort of very proactively, you know, gave the, the, the reporter more information than he asked for. Now the council themselves were going, oh, we don't know that you should, you know, they're not asking for that, so we won't give it. But she said, I don't care. This information's out of date. I'm going to give them the latest housing land audit. And she did. And that won the case. So I think, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, you, you, you're all activists, uh, I presume. You know, don't wait for the system to tell you what to do. It seems that, the, you know, often the, the campaigns that are successful are the ones that just go, don't care what the system is. We're just going ahead. We're going to apply pressure and, and, and get where we can. System is against you. Like I said, you know, uh, you know we've got a case that just down the road from me uh, where the, the developer has appealed um, three times. They've been to judicial review um, and they've put in four planning applications. And this is, this is a campaign that has lasted 15 years, you know, and this is, this is what I, it makes me so angry about the planning system because they go on about these, you know, people who keep on these persistent uh, people. 
um, but they never talk about the persistence of the of the developers who can just come back and they go to court and they things in through the local development plan and they you know they, they use every tactic in the book and there's a lot of them for to be able to use you know um, so uh, the system is against you but you know um, I just say just be you know be true to yourselves as activists if you if you, if you like. It's always the next campaign we're going to win Claire. <laughs> we're going to stick at it and we'll win the next one. I know and then we win them and we're not quite sure what, what, what we're to, to do with ourselves it's like oh, you're fine. <laughs> Thank could you. I you could I comment in in terms of the the the, the question? Uh, Jeff, absolutely, there? Martin. Please go ahead. Yes. Right. Well, the first thing I would like to challenge is the notion that there is the community. Uh, there are a lot of individuals living in close proximity, but they do not necessarily share a view, and it is quite common for us to get letters of objection from, as it were, number twenty-eight and letters of support from number 29. And that is a, a frequent pattern. Uh, in most cases, most members of the community don't comment one way or another. Uh, in terms of when things are successful, very often it is because there is a um, well-organized campaign that points out good planning reasons why something should happen or should not happen. The example I want to give, um, uh, because I think it does show a community working together, but perhaps slightly unconventionally, is North Esk Park, just, just inside Aberdeenshire by a matter of yards across the river North Esk from Angus. In North Esk Park, Aberdeenshire Council has twice voted in favour of a large travellers site. Um, there were, of course, objections from people living in houses close to the site. And this illustrates what I mean about the community. There were 50 to 100 travelers on the site, depending on the time of year. There were also residents living in houses nearby who objected, and there were other people who didn't say anything one way or another. In this case, the council went uh, against officer recommendation and against a statutory objection from SEPA because the travelers, the residents at North Esk, made an extremely convincing case that the flood risk, which was the reason for SEPA objecting, was manageable and that they could have a system whereby they could be evacuated and they could manage it. They are, after all, travellers. They also made a case that the flood risk had been exaggerated and they had a rival hydrological consultant who produced an alternative model suggesting that SEPA's model exaggerated the flood risk. But the real point I want to make there is that the, the side that was successful, as it were, uh, they haven't actually got planning permission because the application has twice been called in by the Scottish government after Aberdeenshire voted in favour of it. The people who were successful were very well organised, but I do really want to emphasise that it, whenever there's a controversial planning application, and there are many, both sides like to claim that they represent the community. And very often there are both views within a locality. And in the case of North Esk, there were people living in houses who objected and there were people living in the traveller site who were in favour. And which community you have sympathy with depends on you as an individual, but they would all live in the area and they probably all thought of themselves as the community. Yeah, some, some, some good points there. Excellent. Thank you, Martin. Martin. Yeah, uh, let's move on. Um, Cameron, if you're with us, uh, I think you must be down in Ayrshire, looking at your question. You've got something from Martin. You, can you go ahead, please, Cameron? Are you muted by any chance? Yeah, so I'm just trying to find my question again quickly. Um, sorry. Uh, yeah, you have You found it? Yeah, I've got it, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so basically in Ayr, we've got three high-rise flats by the river. And and due to cladding issues, I think it's um, related to the Gren the Grenfell Tower thing. Um, they're not they're planning in knocking these three high high rise flats down. Yeah, they're planning in building seven hundred and fifty houses in a greenfield site, the other side of the A seventy seven from air near the hospital, despite many objections. Um, and there's also many brownfield sites that can be used, and despite this, they chose they, they're choosing to build on a greenfield site. So should should this really go ahead? Um, as the houses will cause much more disruption to the ecosystems and land than replacing the cladding 
on the flats. Well, but apparently people prefer a house in a flat. So should such choice be available in this instance when the result will such a, when the result will have such a detrimental impact? Martin, do you want to have a well, it, uh, it, shot at that? I have to say, obviously, it's almost impossible to answer that question because there are so many unknowns in there from, from my point of view. I, I have no idea what the uh, allocation status is of the, the Greenfield site. It may be allocated in the local plan. I have no idea what uh, issue is, whether the um, ownership of the flats and the ownership of the development sites is different or the same. Uh, generally speaking, you don't need planning permission to knock something down if you own it, unless it's attached to somebody else's property. So that's not necessarily a planning matter. Um, clearly, people do need places to live and they need safe places to live. But whether it's appropriate to allow the proposed development on the Greenfield site, I have absolutely no idea because I don't know the full circumstances. And that's part of what people who are deciding on what should be in a local development plan and then what should get or should not get planning permission have to do. And can I perhaps just illustrate just how complicated this can be? Well, we've had comments this evening about um, the desirability, which I agree with, for, for um, meaningful public say over decisions. But I do think it's worth throwing into this discussion the complexity of the decisions and I'm not um, being arrogant and suggesting that most people can't take them and can't absorb that information, just the sheer time involved. And I referred earlier to the Trump golf course application in Aberdeenshire. The 14 people who were on the committee that had to take that decision had been on a site visit, been around the site, shown around, got chance to ask questions and all the rest of it, both of SNH and the developer. We had been to a public hearing in the evening, which lasted five and a half hours and 32, I think, individuals and organizations came and made representations. We had read a hundred-ish page planner's report. We had read an environmental impact assessment. We had read a transport impact assessment. We had read an economic impact assessment. We had read hundreds of pages of reports and spent a, a, a good day's worth of time on site visits and planning hearings. And at the end of that, we were able to vote on that application based on planning issues from a position of knowledge. And I, I don't think I'm being disrespectful of the public to suggest that it is quite impossible for somebody routinely to spend that amount of time to be sufficiently well informed to take that view. And that is why we have elected representatives and representative democracy. Because if it's a complicated matter, you need an enormous amount of information to weigh up to take an informed evidence-based decision. And whilst you know, the person down the pub is perfectly entitled to a view, how he or she arrived at it and how much information they have is the bit you often don't know. So I think that the question, though a good one, it just illustrates to me just how much I would need to know to be able to take an informed evidence-based decision. And in the discussion we're having tonight about public participation, I think that's a very, very relevant point. You need to know an awful lot to take an informed decision about a complex planning matter. Thank you very much for that. I, could I ask, um, Cameron, Cameron, where are you? Are you South Ayrshire? Yeah, I'm South Ayrshire. I live in Alloway, so I do. Um, Cameron, where are Cameron, at the moment, um, what, what's happening a lot is um, some housing policies uh, that have been quite poorly written uh, by the Scottish Government. Uh, and so at the moment, the, the volume house building uh, industry is absolutely running rings around the uh, Scottish Government on this policy. And there's been a recent consultation um, on it to, to kind of strengthening uh, it because um, they've been taking uh, court cases and so on and really strengthening their hand in terms of uh, being able to develop basically where they like. Um, and often these are the lucrative greenfield sites and th th this is happening an awful lot. And at the moment they're really emboldened because they've just won a landmark court case that enables them to basically um, get planning permission uh, on, 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 on greenfield sites, um, as long as they can prove that there is a, a shortfall 
in the five-year effective housing land supply, um, which they can cleverly do because they know how to, um, you know, cook, cook the figures, if yeah. you like. Um, but we have uh, we have done quite a lot of work on this, Cameron, and we're working with people in um, South Ayrshire who have got a grip of this. As as, as Martin says, it's it's mighty complicated. Um, and it does require you uh, learning an awful lot of acronyms, <laughs> but um, we we would uh, be willing to help you out on this particular issue. Um, we're just about to write a help sheet, uh, and just for everybody else, we've also got a how to respond to planning applications uh, a guide, um, and it's it, it's just aimed at you know people you know like yourselves who may have never responded to a planning application before gives you as much information as we think you can you, you, you need so it would sort of like add to what the information that Paul and, and, and Martin have so helpfully given tonight so if you want to access that uh, from our website uh, you know it's free so please please do make the most of that but on the on the housing land supply if anybody's finding that there's developers that are putting in applications for uh, um, in, in the local development plans and, and, and so on, please do get in touch because we've got a we've got a kind of group of people are helping each other um, to to overcome some of these uh, policies which are particularly um, uh, favouring. The Thank you, Claire. Uh, I'm going to suggest we move on. Uh, I'm going to call on Sue Patterson. Uh, she has a question for all speakers. Are you with us, Sue? Thanks, Jeff. Yes. I'm curious to know what you think should happen if a development was approved some time ago, but it no longer meets our current thinking or current new policies. Um, in the context of the Scottish Government declaring a climate and biodiversity crisis, what if a development requires <clears throat> the removal of a forest, a biodiverse forest, which ultimately will impact net zero and biodiversity loss targets. Given that advice from such um, scientific bodies like um, Kew Gardens recommends it's much better to keep current forests than to plant new ones. So could such a development be challenged? Paul, do you want to have a go at that? Jeff, can I comment? If Paul's not... Yeah, by all means. Yeah. Well, I, I am neither a planner nor a lawyer, uh, but my understanding is that once a planning consent has been granted, it is to all intents and purposes impossible to rescind it. Now, it's not quite true, but to all practical intents and purposes, it is irrevocable. And the, there's been comment tonight already about the um, third party right of appeal. And I, I think there's a very strong case for a third party right of appeal in some circumstances. Personally, I wouldn't make it universal, but I think there are circumstances where it's clearly justified. But even that, once that was exhausted and somebody has a piece of paper saying that they've got planning permission, rescinding that would be very difficult indeed. People, whether I mean, it might be a developer, it might be an individual householder, it could be a community group, it could be a charity, you know, whoever's got that piece of paper giving them the legal right to undertake that development. They can start spending money. And if you remove that right, they're going to expect compensation. Um, I, I think there is a case for discussing removing the right to a planning consent if you don't implement it. And of course, if you do nothing at all, it lapses after three years anyway, generally speaking. But, there, but it would be a very, very difficult thing to do because I, I said right at the start of, of, of my introductory remarks, one of the things the planning process does is remove uncertainty. And I don't think any of us should forget that we do all depend upon the economy continuing to function. The process of applying for a planning application, even just as a householder, is quite expensive. If you're developing a large scheme or, or proposing a large scheme, you will spend a lot of money on just making the application and then even more thereafter on your consultations and all the rest of it. If after you've spent all that, the permission that you've spent it to implement is removed, you will go bust. There will be you know, business failures. There will be serious economic consequences unless there's compensation. So by all means, we could have a discussion about rescinding 
granted planning permissions, but we would need to think very, very carefully indeed about the consequences of that of, of doing that for all of us. I accept that in the case that's been suggested, maybe the permission should never have given, been given in the first place. I don't know the circumstances. It sounds to me like it was a very, very poor decision. But once it is taken, it is very difficult in practice to rescind it, to all intents and purposes, I think impossible. And would need a change in the law. And I think we would need to think very hard about that change in the law because it would have a lot of consequences. Yes, you might have to delve deep into the terms of the Town and Country Planning Act 1997, and, and I suspect that there'll, there'll be very little um, uh, applicability there. The approval notice will give the, as Martin said, the, um, the, the amount of time that the developers have uh, to do something, which is usually three years, which is what the, the Town and Country Planning Act uh, recommends. Um, there have been some court cases recently about developers uh, development old developments that have conflicted with newer developments but in this case if it's physically possible to do the work then i, I don't think there's much hope but you can try if you're inter really interested have a look at the tenant country planning act but it's it's, it's it sounds awfully difficult to me there might even be something in the conditions so read read the approval and uh, what the report handling report said but the it sounds a bit dubious. Thank you. So I can only uh, really re um, reiterate what these guys have said, but also just to uh, remind you of your activism skills as well. And of course, um, you know, the more expensive, you know, it's usually the economic reasons uh, uh, if, if a development is no longer economically viable uh, for whatever reason. Uh, then uh, that's that's often a, a, a way that they uh, might not develop uh, in the end. So you might want to have a look. Thank at you. That. Okay, let's move on. Uh, we have a question from Rosie Hunter. Uh, this is quite technical, so I'll let Rosie ask the question. You with us, Rosie? Are you on mute? That's me off now, sorry. Can you hear me now? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, um, we've just had a proposal of a planning notice put in. Um, so someone who wants to build on green belt, which is not in the local development plan. Adjacent land is. They've put in a bid to try and get onto the new, new local development plan. And they also want to build a major development of 350 houses um, on the edge uh, where a suburb meets the rural. And it's also beside a big natural um, space, a moor, et cetera. Um, so we have been involved in communicating. Uh, we had the consultation, the public consultation, which they got the timing wrong. And I put in a document planning nine pages long about all the failures because they wouldn't they wouldn't communicate with the public um so we're just waiting to hear um i know that the uh, re report will be published of their consultation if they do go ahead with planning application i just wondered if our complaints to planning as we put in now will be published if the planning application goes ahead just so it shows that they have not been playing nice from the beginning. So is there a question in that? Yes. Will we be able to see our comments that we're making now in the POAN process if they go ahead with the planning application? Or is what we're pushing in now, will that just disappear into the ether? No, they have, they have to be in the pre the pre um, the pre application report, but you need to make the points again uh, in the planning application stage. Right. In the pre application report, that's the developer writing that. Yeah. Well, what if you because they had submissions and we couldn't even track our submissions because they use a submission form. And when you press submit, everything you'd written disappeared and we didn't even get a confirmation of receipt or a reply. 
So how do we know? How can we verify that what's going in the report is actually what they receive? It, 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 it's very difficult, uh, Rosie, and um, I would, this is a very informal process that you've just taken part in, and that you, I urge you strongly to get involved in the formal, uh, but because if it ever does go, now this is, it sounds like exactly what I was telling Cameron, uh, that this is exactly, you know, the developers absolutely making the most of the, of the uh, very um, favourable situation for them at the moment, um, even though the government have just changed the uh, Scottish planning policy. Again, the developers are taking that to court. Two developers are taking the, the Scottish government to court at the moment about the housing policy. But if you look at uh, the kind of arguments that they're, they're making, they might well be doing it around the shortage of housing land supply. Um, and if they are, that's, uh, it's very well worth getting uh, knowledgeable about that and working out whether you do have a shortage of uh, housing land supply in your area because if you do then they will be pushing to get this site allocated um, mm -hmm. you know to make up that shortfall so um, it's uh, but I would very strongly urge that you get involved you know you you, you forget what you've said to them because it, it quite often does get lost and and, and I would just concentrate on, on 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 officially because if it goes to appeal which you know if it, if, if it does then you know what you've been involved in will not be relevant to the next um, to the appeal case, so you, you, you must have... Uh, there's, there's been a lot of uh, discussion and research and reports written as part of this NFP4, uh, NPF4 process on housing targets uh, and, and their validity at national and, and local level. It might be well worth reading, reading up on those. We don't know how, I mean, Claire might know how they're going to be reflected in the NF, uh, NPF4, but um, there's certainly been a lot of discussion and a lot of people and in many community councils are very concerned, all over Scotland are concerned about, the, you know, this, every, every, everybody is saying there's a shortfall in, in uh, all the councils are saying there's a shortfall in the in meeting housing target. And it's, you know, to quote Blazing Saddles, it's, bullshit i mean it really is and there's a lot of you know there's a lot of academic work going on try and try and board up on that it might give you some useful phrase mm -hmm. that's great thank you yeah leave us your leave us your uh details and we can uh when we were just doing a um a help guide to all this because we're realizing you know there's a lot of people needing it and uh when it comes to mpf4 uh so the national planning framework uh, four is going to be consulted on, um, you've just missed the opportunity uh, to get engaged in the early consultation, but there will be a draft plan uh, in the autumn coming out and it will be a chance to sort of comment on that. And there is, there will be an awful lot around housing targets in there. Um, and I'm not quite sure which way it's going at the moment. There's, there's a huge, huge pressure from the volume house builders who are a massive, massive lobbying force um, like I said, you know, they've got two, two of them are taking the government to court at the moment around these policies. The government really need to be involved and they need to be given a mandate by people like you. You know, I, some of you, Kevin Stewart must be your, your MSP. For God's sake, write to him. He's the planning minister. You know, get him to take action. Uh, you know, he's cent central uh, Aberdeen, I think, isn't he? So, uh, you know, uh, pressure on him uh, to really, you know, deliver... Oh better policies for affordable housing and to close these loops down so that it can stop you know these volume house builders just riding roughshod over what was the msp's name you just said kevin stewart kevin stewart, kevin. Kevin stewart aberdeen central all oh, right he is the how he is we the housing and planning minister you you're lucky you got him as your uh, well, I, you're possibly not lucky, actually, well, yes, but yes, anyway, yes, that's, yes. Uh, that's... <laughs> quite right. Not I'll just remind everyone it's been recorded. <laughs> I, I was very gentle. Liam Carroll uh, also put his head up recently with the elections coming up about the Rubus Law Quarry and um, the failure of the appeal. So, um, yeah, I think it's going to be quite a big issue in this election. Can I just make a couple of comments on the, the vexed issue of housing land supply, which is, you know, another area of contention within planning. And as Claire has already indicated, the developers constantly challenge. I mean, you know, Aberdeen has been arguing with developers about 
what the effective housing land supply is on a yearly basis for, well, forever probably, but certainly for the entire 20 odd years I've been a councillor. I, I don't know the circumstances of the other councils you're talking about, so I'm not going to criticise them, but I would say that as a general rule, a council should be very, very careful not to find itself in a position of not having an adequate effective hand, land supply for the reasons that have been touched upon. Because national planning guidance requires a effective land supply of at least five years and all the rest of it. And if you don't have that, developers can challenge you on the grounds that you are not compliant with planning policy and therefore they should be able to build houses on a site that is not zoned to make up that shortfall. In the time I've been a member of Aberdeenshire Council, we had one brief period when the developers tripped up the council on a consultation process on its local plan. And we had a short interval when we did not have an up-to-date development plan and we were deficient in housing land supply, but it only lasted a matter of weeks. And we didn't determine any planning applications in that time, so we didn't get done. But I, I as I say, I, I won't criticize the council's concern because I don't know the circumstances. But if a council has managed to get itself in a position where it has a severely deficient amount of housing land, it may be that the residents, the electors, want to question the competence of the council in that case. Because although we can debate here whether planning policy and the legal position is correct, it is what it is. And in the current circumstances, finding yourself with a deficient housing land supply is a pretty vulnerable position. And Aberdeenshire has generally, with this one exception, not been there and make sure you renew your local plans as you should, make sure that you have an adequate housing land supply. I would just make a very gentle observation given the nature of the discussion. Most people contributing tonight will be living in a product of a volume house builder. People do actually need what they build and there are an awful lot of people who are still looking for somewhere to live. And whilst of course some developers are taking people on a ride and they're profitable businesses and they pay people's pension funds and all the rest of it. But nevertheless, we as a society do live in their products and an awful lot of people work in that industry. So whilst I can understand the sympathy and sympathize with people who are very upset because of house builders decided to build on the green belt or whatever, um, the purpose of the planning system should be to direct development to an appropriate location. I don't want to subscribe to the idea that somehow we must stop house building. There is a need for it. Could I just come, 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 come in on that a, a little bit uh, because there's a couple of things. Um, so uh, the housing land audit process, which, uh, you know, sort of helps decide how much housing uh, there is uh, required and so on. Um, you know, there's a degree of regulatory capture there because the volume house builders are involved in that process and, and, and they have a certain, um, they, don't, they don't have the altogether say, but they can certainly sway things. So I think that's a, a bit of a problem um, where the developers seem to be, you know, part of every part of the system. And uh, um, so um, that's, that's a problem. Um, the other problem that we have with the system is that um, we have what we call uh, public-led planning. So um, at the moment, we rely very heavily on the private uh, developers uh, to private industry to, to deliver housing. Um, and uh, what one of the things that Planned Democracy is really pushing for is for far more public led planning, i.e. for local authorities to be able to um, purchase land um, and, and assembly it <laughs> land in the process of land assembly and, and put the development where it is where they recognize it's needed so that it doesn't uh, takes away that sort of incentive for the uh, the volume house builders to be de delivering uh, you know these these executive houses on on the lucrative sites um, so uh, that's that's one of the things that we're really pushing for in the, in the uh, national planning framework and they're, they're sympathetic Claire, thank you for that. Um, just to have a quick time check, it is uh, seven minutes to nine. Um, I'm not going to allow any further questions. Uh, so apologies to anybody who's hoping to get a question answered. Uh, we've run out of time. I will, however, ask Claire 
the exercise about what three words was that was that just a, a straw poll for tonight or are you doing a, an ongoing campaign on your website i think uh, i don't know i might now uh, <laughs> i'd okay. like so uh, I presume we're going to save the chat um, and uh, if, if, if we haven't been able to answer questions, uh, uh, you know, I'd be happy to sort of uh, follow up on, on some of them if people could leave their email addresses. But uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll certainly uh, maybe do if you send me the chat, uh, Alison or, or, or Jeff, then uh, I'll make another Wordle and I'll put that on our, our Facebook page as well. I think wonderful will be the front and centre in capitals based on the uh, we will see what the comments was. I saw. <laughs> all right. Um, thank you very much uh, to all three speakers, uh, both for your presentations and for uh, surviving the question and answer. Um, no rotten tomatoes. So that's that's pretty good. Um, and there's been a fantastic uh, set of questions. We haven't been able to cover them all. Um, and uh, if anybody wants to follow up, um, please check up on our uh, AberdeenClimateAction.org website uh, and there'll be pointers to the, um, th there are different uh, presentations and the Q&A session as well. So I'm gonna uh, hand back now to Alison for her final remarks. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. Um... If you do want uh, Claire or Martin or Paul, um, I think probably Claire's the one that's offered, uh, to, to reply to your questions, then just PM them with, with your emails because um, we don't have that. So if you want a kind of response, then do um, just private message on the chat to um, Susan, um, to Claire. I mean, Claire, do you want to put your email or the kind of organizational email in there? That might be the easiest way of doing it, actually. So if you if Claire's just about to put the email in, you can email her with, any questions you might have um, and I, if Paul and Martin feel the same and there's no pressure then do the same um, but what I will say Aberdeen Climate Action there, there you go it's info at planningdemocracy.org.uk um, is that Aberdeen Climate Action has put in consultations to the National Planning Framework both last year and just recently um, I think that we from our perspective, we do need a change to address some of the, the inherent bias in the planning um, procedure. The developers shouldn't have that level of, um, of power. Uh, as Martin quite rightly said, though, we do need housing, but we need the right kind of housing, the right kind of place. Um, and I think we do need to have climate considerations um, in that as well as community considerations as well. So if people do want to make a difference, I think that's become a very clear within this Climate Cafe that the laws need to change, the policies need to change. The National Planning Framework Forum was very um, <laughs> pro uh, community involvement and, um, and doing things for climate and putting the climate first. It's been watered down since then, you can very clearly see. Um, so I think that we all need to stand up and, and show that we want it differently. And I think that Claire's quite right that our elected representatives can only act if they feel they have a mandate to do so. And they can only act as Martin's poll pointed out if the law gives them the ability to do that. Um, at the moment, it doesn't. So um, so let's, let's put our efforts into where it's needed, which it seems to be at central government level to a large extent in the policy and laws. Um, you can find recordings of this talk. We'll, we'll upload it in the next couple of days to our YouTube channel, and you can find a link to that. Um, I, I'll put it into the, um, the chat just now. Um, oh, it's always a pain doing this um, while talking at the same time. So we're ahead of you, Alison. Right oh, good. Good, good, good. That's what I like. So, Sonny doing it for me. Um, but I just want to thank you all for coming tonight and a huge, huge thanks to our speakers on a very complicated and an emotive subject. Thank you. Take care. Good night. And do look at climateweeknortheast.org and, and go along to some events during, them, during that week. Bye-bye. Thank you.